It's an IED strike, three casualties, one Alpha, two Charlies. We have a nine-liner with three Canadians that are coming in. Three Canadians, one Alpha, two Charlies. Two stretcher, one walking? Yeah. I suspect they're pretty busy out there. Our medics are very, very good about, first of all, caring for the patient, and second of all, giving us the information. All stations, all stations, CSM, CSM, ETA, any time now. I think once we get over this bridge, I'll give it a the line of sight and cut through the ridge, and I look out and see the Alpha is a VSA. Vital signs absent. They cannot officially declare anyone dead out there, but this is someone who will not come here. Hello and welcome to the Fifth Estate. I'm Gillian Findlay. You have just been to a place few Canadians will ever go, to the drama at the heart of war, Canada's war in Afghanistan. It's a critical moment that can only have two outcomes. The happy news that a Canadian soldier's life has been saved. The devastating news. Another coffin, another ramp ceremony, another funeral back home. Wherever you stand on Canada's mission here, important international duty or costly folly, you'll want to meet the remarkable people in our story tonight. They are doctors, nurses, medics, healthcare professionals, people who understand the cost of this war because they live and work in the middle of it. Last year, a fifth estate team gained exclusive access to the military trauma center at Kandahar Airfield and to the medical staff, most of them Canadian, who make it run. They're the ones who retrieve the wounded, then battle to save their lives. It gives them a unique perspective on what's happening in Afghanistan, one they will share with you tonight. One, two, three, roll. Let me know if it hurts. 30 minutes after that helicopter delivered them from the front, the two surviving Canadians arrive at the hospital. The armored vehicle they were riding in was hit by a roadside bomb, and they don't yet know their buddy is dead. Good pulses bilaterally? Yes, sir. Thank you. Abdomen is soft and so Any pain with that? No pain in the ankles? The medical teams focus on their physical injuries first, not as bad as they'd feared. Then they turn it over to the soldiers' commanders to break the news. Another day in Kandahar, another day at the hospital. Unfortunately, around here, there's no quiet time. Jets are always taking off. <laughs> Planes are always landing. Sergeant Major Doug Libby of St. Stephen, New Brunswick, is a career soldier who wears many hats. He's a physician's assistant. He's in charge of all his company's medics. He even washes ambulances in his spare time. Not that in six months he's had much of that. You sometimes wake up in the middle of the night dreaming about uh, what your next step is or you wake up in a cold sweat thinking about uh, how you're going to deal with it. The base that's now home sprawls for kilometers. Amid the warehouses and the mud, you'll find a cluster of prefab trailers, NATO's busiest hospital in the country. It's not much to look at. It's been patched together as a war effort has. But despite the odd leak, it works. When word goes round that injured are on the way, there's no shortage of hands. I'm leaning towards Alpha and one, Bravo in three, just for space reasons, and then we can put the Delta. Or the Alpha As one of the two. hospital's trauma leaders, it's Major Sandra West's job to prioritize cases. Alpha is the worst, and they work down from there. There's been another bomb blast, and more casualties are on the way. How long is it going to take? 15 minutes? 15 minutes, they should be here. She's a mother of two from Ottawa, a military GP, who's getting her first real taste of medicine in a war zone. You see things that would be shocking for lay people. You see some very horrific injuries. Are these AP, ADP, or... You got anything on you? No. ADP? Today, the injured are Afghan fighters, a group of border policemen, the people Canada's army has come to help, but who nevertheless get frisked on the way in. Are they all 
Once in, though, the treatment they get is exactly the same. The truth is, most of the fighters who end up in this hospital are Afghan. Is this the Delta? This is the last one, yeah. He has a good airway, he's breathing. What hurts? Darky? Darky? Can you just ask him what happened? Six of pesos. Uh-huh. Six of pesos. This young officer even has the scars of a repeat customer. And if you can take a look at him, see if you can mark them on your marking sheet. Uh, it's a little uh, frustrating to uh, look at a 20-year-old man and realize that he's been here before. Today, the worry is his head. Uh, we're going to need a CT of his head, I think. But let's... And what might have been packed inside that bone. He's got a penetrating wound on the side here. That has penetrated. He is lucky because that doesn't look deep. There's probably very few doctors in Canada who've seen blast injuries, um, even gunshot wounds. Most ER physicians, unless you're in inner city Toronto, inner city Montreal, inner city Vancouver, you're going to see a couple of gunshot wounds in your career. Um, I probably saw more in my first week than most Canadian ER physicians see. Yeah. See? Mm. Wow. What the heck? The x-ray of the policeman's head shows something metal, but what? That's kind of cool. Yep, so my just went to Home Depot and got a handful of hardware. Just as the hospital is jerry-rigged, so too is the staffing. For most of Major Terry Rutkowski's tour, there's been no neurosurgeon. The Army trained him to be a skull and facial specialist. And more than once, he's found himself operating outside his comfort zone. I'm not a neurosurgeon, so... Were you but, nervous? Uh, well, I was, but at the same time, the alternatives were were no better than what I had to offer. So um, it's kind of at the point where you have nothing to lose. Can you pass him a little bowl or something? Today, Rutkowski gets help. A British Army neurosurgeon happens to be transferring through. Together, they remove what is in that Afghan policeman's head. Whoever made the bomb had indeed been to the hardware store. What is it? Oh, it's, um, it's, it's a nut. It's a nut. Yeah, yeah, nut. Yeah. Huh. Huh. As ugly as this war gets, it's still the ordinary Afghans, the civilians, who bear the brunt of it. And at the hospital, they see plenty of those, too. Morning again. Okay. That's fine. Let's have a look here. While Major Rutkowski slept, this little guy arrived. Izzatulai is eight years old. He was flown in from a neighboring province with his grandfather after an explosion ripped through their village, killing his sister and shredding his face. For Rutkowski, who has two small children of his own back in Edmonton, it's going to be tough. We do frequently see children here, and they're often sad stories. Horrific scarring, uh, horrific fractures, some burns. And uh, we do see the occasional child that doesn't make it. It's a very sad day here. Yeah. It's not immediately clear Izatula will make it either. He can't talk or even swallow. He's in pain, and there's no doubt he's afraid. Perhaps that's why no one's really sure what happened to him. For now, it doesn't matter. What he needs is surgery likes his grandfather. As if turning over his most precious possession, his grandfather carries him to the operating room. It will take Rutkowski and his team 20 hours to repair his face to save his life. It was a critical injury. It definitely was. Uh, it could have lost his airway and and uh, basically suffocated uh, due to the injury itself. Uh, he was part of the group that had the bolt in the brain. In the meantime, the parade of injured Afghan fighters continues. This one's arrived out of the blue with wounds that are turning nasty. This guy's an ally, eh? He's, he's one of the good guys. He was, he was blown up a few days ago and, uh, and uh, shipped off to a 
civilian facility that had no capabilities, and he's been wandering around in limbo for the last number of days. Captain Neil Pritchard trained as a military doctor, but after 16 years in the forces and having seen no action, he left. Then came 9-11 and Canada's decision to go to Afghanistan. I trained my entire life for this, and I am a great believer in the fight against terrorism. Uh, do I believe in the attempt to stabilize this country? Uh, sure, if we can do it. But Pritchard's the first to admit that the slogging is a lot harder than he'd imagined, and that he didn't understand just who would be doing the bulk of it. We were led to believe that this was a low-level insurgency, and it may very well be from the Canadian and Allied standpoint. Our casualties are not that severe, but these poor Afghanis are taking it on the chin daily. They, whereas we might lose one or two, they're losing 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or hundreds. So what really surprised me was the amount of combat that is in fact going on. We're ready, go. Let's go! The Canadians may be losing fewer, but when they are the incoming, there's no question the mood is different. When we hear it's Canadians, you could almost hear a pin drop here in the trauma bay uh, until we hear uh, what the injuries are, um, how they're coming in, uh, and then we start talking within ourselves how, what the game plan is. That's the B1, where do you want it? One or two? Okay, down. Uh, his pressure's been good. It's been like 109. The talk, unlike in all those TV dramas, never gets very loud here. Hey, face, he's fine. Control and discipline are essential to this kind of work, especially when the wounds are serious. Yep, go ahead now. Two Canadian soldiers have been helicoptered in from a forward operating base. There was a rocket attack, it seems, and both are peppered with shrapnel. This young man took it in the face, and it's clear to everyone he's not in good shape. Let me give you some medication to bleed this sleep, okay? So that we can look after you and fix your face. What happened We're all bedding down for the night. Is it just an explosion. Rocket or? Uh, we think it might have been an RPG. Okay, now we should be able to find it without going any deeper. That's done now. There we go. Make Did you get me. it? Thank you. Can I see it? Yeah. Holy, it's a big piece. As Doug Libby scavenges for metal, facial surgeon Rutkowski consults on what to do for the more serious case. I'm just trying to decide how we can stabilize this so it doesn't move around. The soldier from Quebec is 22 years old. His jaw has been shattered. He's no longer breathing on his own. Tonight, their job is to stabilize him. It's 10 o'clock now. So, do you want to shut it off to him, off to him over there? It will be done before they finish. At the Canadian-run trauma hospital in Kandahar, patients don't tend to stay long. But as soon as we know a time, we'll let you know. After an operation that lasted all night, the young Quebec soldier with the shattered jaw is about to leave to be airlifted to the finest medical treatment the military can offer first in Germany and then back home. He was very lucky in many ways. He had very serious injury that uh, uh, was about a centimeter away from taking his life. So, uh, but right now he's very, very stable. So he's, he's had a good course. Um, and uh, with some reconstruction back home, I think he'll, he'll make a, a good recovery. One, two, can you just can you just tell him I'm just going to examine him. I won't hurt him. Is it Eight-year-old Isatula is out of surgery as well and still in rough shape. For a child who's never been outside his village, never even been to school, it has to be terrifying, and the doctors know it. Does his breathing feel comfortable to him? It doesn't hurt him to take a breath? No. Can you ask him if it's okay if he'll let me listen to him? Because yesterday he was really frightened and worried. 
His caretaker today is Rakesh Patel, an ICU doctor from Ottawa, a civilian who was recruited to come here for a month. It sounded like a neat idea at the beginning, right? It's like, wow, kind of neat to work in a war zone. But then you're in a bit of a sobering moment, you ask yourself, well, what's it really going to be like? And am I going to be good enough, actually, to work in a war zone? Can I walk the walk? Um, and so part of coming here was, I suppose, in a way, uh, self-discovery. Sounds much better. It may have been self-discovery for Patel, but it was self-interest for the military. The Canadian forces just don't have enough specialists of their own. The other part about being here and seeing all this stuff is, now what can I learn from the way the military manages mass casualties that I could take away from here and apply to the management of casualties in, in a civilian disaster? He'll probably be going back to the room he was in yesterday. See if we can help his mouth become a little bit better and less painful. Good. All right. Canadian soldiers who serve here believe they are making a difference. At the hospital, they see the price. They know that when those convoys of healthy young soldiers head out, it's only a matter of time before some of them will be headed back in and another trauma will have begun. First one right here, guys. Today, it's another four Canadians hit by another roadside bomb. The military calls an improvised explosive device, or IED. They are the insurgents' weapon of choice these days, easily hidden and potentially deadly. The vehicle these soldiers were riding in was armored, but they still got knocked around. When they have injuries, the doctors here are getting pretty familiar with. When you hit the IED, if you're sitting in the vehicle like this, and there's a big blast here, it goes up here, and it goes up here. He has a very bad knee pain, okay? You get a, an awful lot of problems with the spine, uh, the sacral spine, the lumbar spine, and right up into the thoracic spine. One, two, three. So, with that mechanism of injury, we get very concerned about people having back pain. Lower back. Lower back? Okay. Uh, you want, you want to go ahead and do these? It's just this lower back that's happening. So that will make it easier for us to get around. Go back, go back, go back. He has pain over his like L5, S1 area, so it would be great if we could do the L spine okay. while we're the there also. Yeah. One stop shopping, we'll get it done. In the end, these four get off lucky. By the next day, all have been released. But outside, the weather is starting to change, and that means more danger to come. A few days later, another two Canadians are brought in. Hello. Hello. Just hours after that, another three. Most are from engineering units tasked with securing and re-securing territory the Taliban keeps winning back. X-rays! The drizzly weather makes it easier to plant bombs and harder to see them, leaving the kids in the convoys little more than sitting ducks. This uh, gentleman was a gunner in the turret, and uh, he's really just sustained a minor laceration to the forehead over the eyebrow. And the main thing now is I'm just trying to find the exact right suture material. But MD stands for make do, and that's what I will do, if I must. For Sergeant Major Doug Libby, it's all hitting too close to home. So this is, by my count anyway, the fifth IED blast in four days that have sent injured to this hospital. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, What's going on? the IEDs have definitely been uh, increased. Good one. Two and three. Unfortunately, we're getting the, the brunt of it, and uh, the Canadians are getting hit. So I just hope that there's no more. But there is always more. This time, they arrive by armored personnel carrier. The injured Canadian is in the first one. What he doesn't know is that the second APC contains his friend, a friend who did not survive. 
what we need to do is concentrate on his physical needs and then step in and concentrate on his uh, psychological needs. I can suture the lip. Okay. The mood is even quieter now. The young private has broken his teeth and he'll need dental surgery. But he'll need a lot more than that once they tell him the bad news. We'll have mental health very close by, ready to step in. The Padre always comes for these. Uh, so he will get all the support he needs once we know he is physically stable. When I see you know, a young person stand in harm's way for, for us, um, the, the biggest thing in my mind is, and why are we here? To the guys back home in, in Parliament who debate this thing, or for lack of thereof, do they actually really know what it's like at the sharp end of the stick? Because this kid does. Right? And it's the old saying, old men create wars, young men fight them. And you see that every day here. And I think that's a lesson learned. I think that's a lesson that needs to be learned. You must remember freedom isn't free, to use a cliche. And that the cost of freedom is lives. A factor that Canada had forgotten for 40 years, thinking that we were just a blue beret country. Well, we're not. When you have a conflict, it is unfortunate, young people die. It's sad. As a senior Canadian doctor on duty, Sandra West has another job today, officially declaring the Canadian soldier dead. They've lost 11 on this tour so far. And while it's only a few hundred meters from the hospital to the base's morgue, it's a trip that never gets easier, no matter how many times she makes it. It's very unusual for patients to die in the hospital. Uh, and when we go down there, we know that we could not have done anything for them. So all we can do is get the information we need to help them. You're a mom? Oh, yeah. yeah. By watching you, you, you're a mom to a lot of these kids, too. You never stop being a mom, I guess. No. It when you go into there and you know what you're going in to do. I know there's a mom at home. So I do what I can. Thanks. Back in the recovery room, it's so much easier caring for the living. Isatula still needs help breathing, but he's improving. We're just going to clean that up for a little bit, okay? Rhonda Crew is a captain from Goose Bay. She's seen a lot in her nursing career, but nothing that prepared her for Kandahar. I've seen and learned things here that you would never see in Canada, and thank God you would never see some of these injuries in Canada. I know, it's because I'm playing with it, huh? All right, then. Little ones are harder. They're not where I'm most comfortable. Good. I just haven't got all that much experience with little ones. Does that feel better? Make sounds like? Yeah, here is better. I know, eh? Little ones are always on Terry Rutkowski's mind. Let's make a phone call here. How was your trip at the Science Center? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm kidding you about the trip thing. <laughs> I understand that you, you fell over the robot or something that was there. Back in Edmonton, his children live a life unimaginable to Afghan kids like Isatula. Maybe Abby would say hi to me today. How's she been? Hi, Abby. Are you okay? You having a good day today? I sure miss you. They're not all that different at this point in their lives. Um, probably if my children were here, they could play together as children do. Dad loves you. How's your dance? How's the dancing classes going? Oh, and the gymnastics too. Okay, who's my medic that's going with me? Badly? Of all his jobs, the hardest for Doug Libby is organizing troops for ramp ceremonies. He's done it too often. Okay. Let's go. I've got 23 years in, and uh, it's 
I'm deciding whether it's going to be time for me to retire in the next two years or whether I want to keep on going. Um, it's not easy. Um, it's not easy for my troops. Tonight, they are honoring the latest Canadian to die, the young IED victim who arrived at the hospital in the back of that APC and who will start his journey home the same way. We are a different breed of people. It's easy for people to go in and nod their head and say, they understand, they understand, but you don't understand until you see what we see. If you're an injured soldier in Afghanistan, this is the sound you want to hear. And this is the person you want to see. In addition to working the wards, Rhonda Crew, the nurse from Goose Bay, flies medevac duty, retrieving casualties from the front. While we're flying, we are constantly scanning. We're just like this the whole time. And basically, we're just trying to make sure that we don't see any flashes, which usually indicate a scope or a metal object, which would lead us to believe small arms fire or anti-aircraft. Anything that we really don't want coming our way. You get the report, you get an idea whether it's an Alpha Bravo Charlie saying how serious it is. But until you actually see them, you don't really know how it's going to be. And yeah, you hear leg injury, but you don't know is it going to be an open leg injury with the bone sticking out or is it a bruise? If they get to us alive, then they live. It's true, the hospital has a great record. If you come in with a pulse, they like to say, chances are you'll make it home. So it's a lot to live up to if you're new. My goal is to help you here uh, to understand the way things have been functioning. A new rotation of specialists has arrived, including more civilian doctors. Jet lagged and feeling just a little out of place, they're trying to navigate what for them is a whole new world. So if we look at the chain of command, and I won't, and I keep calling generals colonels and colonels captains and captains majors, um, and I'm getting away with it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Dave Evans is a trauma surgeon from Vancouver. Among the many things he's learning is that for all their success here, there are limits to what the medical teams can do. I can see difficult decisions. You know, I'm not fully apprised of exactly what the resources are outside of this hospital for the local population. So part of that is, is ignorance on our part. We, we don't really know what's there. Uh, I know that it's not to the level that you could get in Germany or in, in Canada. If we have a rocket attack, this is an example of the cement bunkers that you go into. They're used to working, of course, in our developed healthcare system where the level of care can, can essentially be unlimited. And here we, we can offer uh, a great deal of treatment, but uh, the level that we reach here is, is certainly less than what, than what you can expect. There's always an end point. There is yeah. an end point here. Afghans show up to the hospital all the time. The criteria are life, limb, or eyesight. If any of those are threatened, they get care. But once they're out of danger, they have to fall back on their own health care system, such as it is. Lift, lift. We get a call from the gate. We quickly load our ambulance with the patients and out to the gate we go. These guys need follow-ups. We have a picture of them. We know who's coming back for follow-up. One, two, three, up. For Doug Libby, the goodbyes are often difficult. I mean, back in Canada, we have the luxury of saying, come back and see us. Here, they might live so far away that they can't come back. So you know, as they're going out the door, that's the last you'll probably see of them. So the follow-up care that we'd like to give, sometimes it's just impossible to give here. They do try to keep children longer, but the day is coming when Isatula, too, will have to go home. Each day, he's stronger and more curious about all that he sees here. But his scars will last a lifetime without plastic surgery, something his grandfather, a poppy farmer, can barely understand, let alone provide. And then there are all the other Isatulas outside that fence. 
The doctors here can save individual Afghans, but they never confuse that with saving the country. In fact, some have big questions about why Canada came to Afghanistan in the first place. If the goals are to establish personal rights and freedom, sure, because I would want that back home too. So if that's what we're here for, I, I, I don't have a problem with that. I, I guess what I have a problem is, is why aren't we using those same goals elsewhere? You know, why here? Uh, what's so special about Afghanistan that the people of Darfur are lacking or Burma is lacking or mm -hmm. elsewhere? Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, I'm still in conflict as to whether I should be supporting the overall mission, as you call it, as opposed to the very local mission of, of what the hospital is all about. There's no shortage of things to be conflicted about here, and sometimes they walk right in the door. This man is a prisoner, an Afghan who was captured fighting against the soldiers this hospital fights to save. Just make sure no one's in there, and if there are, push them out. Under international law, they must treat detainees, but they can't know their identity. To prevent the Afghan from knowing theirs, he wears a blindfold and earplugs. For Dave Evans, still in his first week here, it's nothing short of bizarre. What's his name? <laughs> Detainee. No, it's right here. Okay, I don't have his church. I have eight people around me for an exam, um, yeah. but I can't see the face of my patient. You can't see mine. And then I cut these things out. Okay. And then we'll have a look inside. I'll, I'll probably open this up. It doesn't look terrible. I mean, we can't really talk to each other, but through an interpreter. Interpreter? Yes, sir. Do you want to just let him know? Uh, We're just going to take some pictures at the He's got his earplugs off so he can hear. Okay. I'm going to do this, okay? That's okay. That's fine. Um, so I don't really know anything else about him than his wound. Sorry, does that hurt? Ask him if that hurts. In a different context, this might be a man who is out to kill you. Yeah, we think about that, um, and that's why everyone's identity is protected. Um, I guess, he, yeah, you just have to deal with that. I, I, he's a patient, and I'm going to fix his wound and try not to think about the rest of it. When you're in the business of saving lives, there's often no time to think or to ask questions. For all the good care Izutula has received, no one had ever asked his grandfather what really happened, who did this, until we did. It turns out it was Dutch soldiers, the good guys, who attacked the village. According to Grandad, they panicked after one of their convoys hit an IED. So did he see the soldiers firing? Were there Taliban in the village? Were people firing from the village to the soldiers? The Dutch admit it probably was their troops who did this to Izatula and killed his sister. The soldiers thought they were being attacked. For Dr. Rutkowski, who hadn't heard the story before, it really didn't matter. I just like him to swallow, like. Close, see if he can close his mouth. If it's accurate, if that is true, how do you how do you feel about that? Patching up the kids who've been injured by the coalition forces. Well, I think if that was truly what happened, then I think it's even more important that we are here to provide that care. And then open. Yeah. Nice breaths. Very good. Over the months, this is going to continue to change in shape as the tissue matures. So. Is he unable to swallow? Is he he's eating, so he's he's small. Small. All the drooling. Dave Evans came to Afghanistan wanting to do something to help. As he puts a face to the conflict, he's happy to leave the politics to others. I'm not sure that it's wrong, I'm not sure that it's right. Um, I'm trusting our government to make a good decision about this and to keep thinking about it as, as time goes. And I just know that, you know, this, this cannot be the wrong thing to be here to help. But that is a different thing than saying, yeah. you know, this, we should be here because I believe that the outcome of this is going to make us a better country. That's right. You know, I, I'm here in an apolitical context. Maybe that's an easy out for me, but uh, that's the truth.
This evening, I'm afraid, we have three Afghan soldiers who were struck by a rather accurate rocket-propelled grenade fire. We need some more stretcher bearers. Back in the emergency ward, they're back at work. We have two significant head injuries, one of whom has a large deficit and difficulty breathing. Do we have vitals yet? One of whom has a clear penetrating injury and difficulty breathing. Can anybody get a pulse? That's it, that's the third, which has a uh, more minor head injury, although we don't know that for sure, but is also peppered with shrapnel. Can you ask him to see if he can wiggle his fingers for me? And that's so good to watch out of way. It's got a fairly sluggish heart rate. This one might get a little gruesome. There, okay. Still waiting. Can you tell me? It's the cost of war, and this is war. And war is not polite, and it isn't neat. It is dirty, it is grimy, it is grubby, it is confused, and that's the nature of it. I think at this point we've seen that he's not responding to pain whatsoever. We have a heart rate that's been progressively climbing down. His blood pressure is starting to fall on us as well. We have an open head injury. I think we've done the extent of what we're able to do. I would like to call this code, but does anybody dissent? Despite their best efforts and that reputation for saving all who make it here, it's clear this young soldier will be an exception. Why don't we allow him to comfort measures and then we'll call it when they, uh, this is real, so let's go ahead and, uh, are you trying to keep that on there? Just trying to keep his order blood till his heart rate stops because it's still going to ooze to that his heart quit speed in front of him. Two Afghan fighters have been saved to fight another day. Let's just take it off for a second. But tonight, this one is gone. How old do you think he is? I would guess he's probably early 20. They tend to look young. Stop. All right, again, I think everybody did a really good job. Thank you all for your effort. Good job. Sorry I turned out way too. It's not all life and death drama in Kandahar. There's downtime, too. Easy with the sticks! The hospital has a mean ball hockey team, and they're in the playoffs. It's a little bit of home in a foreign land. But the land is at war, and soon enough, the medical teams will be back at work. Number one is a very serious head injury braddying down. Number two is two broken legs, very serious. Tourniquet is in place. Three is two broken legs, very serious injury. We're going to move you. You stay nice and still. We'll move you ourselves, OK? So I suspect that these two have probably got lobster legs, blown apart lobster legs. Bay one may or may not be survivable, but we got to try. Within 15 minutes of their arrival, two injured coalition soldiers are in operating rooms. The artery looks intact, but um, I think it's in spasm. In one, the fight is to save his legs. I think it's bleeding from the bone. Next door, they're reconstructing another shattered face. A third soldier gets the news that his leg injury is likely Hello. beyond help. Hello. The blood supply doesn't appear to be very good. And the nerve function, your sensation doesn't appear to be very good. So let's probably get end up with an amputation. He'll still be going in number one. Neil Pritchard organizes another team for that surgery. He never gets used to what he sees here, but after nearly six months, he's come to accept it. Do you have any, re any regrets for having made the decisions you did to come back? No, none whatsoever. You've never second-guessed yourself? None the time whatsoever. You've been here? Fellow can go to CT. If, unless you want to take him to the OR right away. I wish we lived in a world that we didn't have to have armies fighting each other. I wish we lived in, a, lived in a world where we were free of being attacked. You know? And in that case, I'd be the first to take off the uniform. Good luck. Thank you. War is to be avoided under all circumstances, but if it's to be fought, it's to be won. The time has come for Izutula to go home. So I've got the money here for their cab money. back to Tarancot. It's the 3000 They've done what they can here. The money is for a taxi back to their village, seven hours away. Is he excited to go home? 
for Terry Rutkowski and for everyone here, the moment is bittersweet. You were saying earlier with uh, Isatola that you would have liked in a perfect world to have kept him longer. Yeah. I feel sad for them, of course. He's going to be facing a very difficult life in Afghanistan as a normal person with normal features and normal abilities. This is going to make his life ten times more difficult in already a place that is difficult to survive just as a regular person. He's touched a lot of people here, mm -hmm. that boy, hasn't he? And yet he went home today. And yeah, he went home today, and which is what? fantastic. But to what? Well, that's exactly it, isn't it? Uh, to what? Because um, I'm sure his grandfather watching us do all this, to him was a miracle. You know, just looking at his body language and his facial expressions, I, I'm sure he was thinking, this is unbelievable. But you have to wonder, now that we've fixed them, what's he going to? And there's no guarantee that tomorrow he's going to be walking along the street in his village and the same thing may happen again. Um, and that's, you always, that's what you question. But that doesn't mean I can't treat him now. Because if I always think that way, then I'll never treat anybody. Right? We'll, we'll just do nothing. We're gonna have six. There's six people on the first bird. Our last night in the hospital turns out to be the busiest. Six wounded Afghan soldiers all at once. As usual, everyone's here to help. And for the first time, Dave Evans, the trauma specialist from Vancouver, is in charge. Uh, I'm the overseer, actually, so, so that's what the white hat is. At least we have some agreement as to who's gonna make priority decisions. Can I, can I talk? Yep. Yeah. Okay. up! Can I have everybody here just for one minute, please? We're not sure exactly why he's here. Trauma Bay 4. Ray, can you give a can you give a report? Yeah. Just gonna do uh, fast cut abdominal pain. Can you do C D head and, and neck? Yes. Yeah. Yes, of course. Sandra, do you need a do you need a uh, interpreter with that help you? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> By now, Evans has seen it all. Surgeries, amputations, young men who died on the table, and those who never made it that far. He's made a point of attending the ramp ceremonies, two in just 10 days. All of this in a month the military calls one of the quietest so far. Since you've been here, what has your thinking changed? Has it evolved? Only to, to state that I, I believe we need to rethink it constantly. 50 of fentanyl, followed by another 50 of rocket if you want to use a big dose of morphine on top. Yeah, the question is really, you know, when does this finish? And uh, what's, the, what's the gain out of all of it? And what's the permanent benefits of people? Is that okay, Steve? Yeah, there we just lots of blood in it. I don't have any more knowledge now than when I arrived as to what makes this right or, or wrong or winnable or losable. Um, I just think it's our obligation as Canadian citizens, as citizens of the world, you know, as part of the international community to make sure that we only need these guys here one day longer than they need to be. We need a bear hugger too. Let's get a bear hugger. This guy is worse than I thought. Quiet up! Okay, good. The story is evolving. We now have three alphas coming in, a mixture of American and ANA, and we have upwards of 17, 18 plus others coming in. Estimated time of arrival, 15 minutes. 